Justin Whiten, a former State Department senior advisor, a principal at D.C. International Advisory. Thanks for being with us. It has been the approach of, of this administration to uh, reach out diplomatically to Tehran. And to some extent, that's been the approach of European allies as well. Have we reached the breaking point now with Tehran? Does this change things? That's right. Iran may have finally miscalculated and actually done what many thought was impossible, which was exhaust European patience for endless ne diplomatic negotiations. Before you had President Obama and his outstretched hand to Iran, you had European negotiations, which have started, uh, I believe, in 2003, gone on off and on since then over trying to talk Iran out of its nuclear weapons aspirations, something it's never confessed to. It's very hard to see how that goes on now if you have Europe. Uh, France and Britain stopping just short of breaking diplomatic relations. It's hard to see how sort of the fantasy that we're going to talk right. around out of its nuclear weapons program continues. Interestingly, it is London that has imposed, the British government, strong sanctions against uh, Iran's central bank, which of course funds their nuclear program. President Obama has so far refused to do that. Uh, do you think Congress will force him to do it? It seems so. And actually, for a Congress that hasn't done a lot on foreign policy, just Thursday, the Senate voted 100 to 1 to require the Obama administration to sanction the Central Bank of Iran, a step, as you noted, that London has taken. It's likely the House will follow suit. But so far, the Obama administration has resisted all of these incremental steps or acquiesced to them only reluctantly, has still basically stuck with its hope that we can outstretch our hand and that Iran will proverbially unclench its fist. Let me switch over to what's happening in Egypt. Uh, the voting is uh, well underway. The early returns suggest that the Egyptian militants, the Muslim Brotherhood, together with the ultra-conservative Islamists, are the early winners. Um, and, you know, the liberals are doing poorly. Uh, and, in fact, the Muslim Brotherhood and the ultra-conservatives are threatening to impose Sharia law if they gain control. How bad is this, if at all, for the West? Well, it's extremely bad, and it raises the specter that Islamists are going to achieve through the ballot box, ironically, what they so far have been unable to achieve through terrorist attacks. You know, recently in Morocco and Tunisia, you had Islamists win pluralities, not, right, uh, not outright majorities. But now in Egypt, indications are that the Muslim Brotherhood and Salafis, which are even more ardent advocates of Islamist tyranny, may win. And we're doing very little about this. And the stakes are very large, not just in Egypt, but across the whole Middle East. Will the Islamists team up with other radicals in other neighboring countries like Iran, Pakistan, Iraq, Saudi Arabia? Mm -hmm. That's right. So in addition to implementing Sharia or possibly clerical style rule, what you have in Iran, to doing that in Egypt, you'll have them working together. And they have shown in the past a great capacity to put aside smaller differences to work towards broader goals. So working with Islamists, the Iranian regime, those who are uh, trying to subvert what's left of democracy in Iran, those who have already subverted democracy in Lebanon, they'll do that. And it'll make life harder for us uh, across the region. It'll make it harder for us to press economic and security issues and the neutral parties you have throughout the region will feel they have to make deals with the bad actors in their neighborhood, you know, especially since it's coming amid the backdrop of U.S. withdrawal. The, the more liberal parties in Egypt who are losing um, are much more uh, democratically friendly, friendly to the West. Did we miss an opportunity to help them the way we have helped others, perhaps, for example, during the Cold War? We have. We'll be accused of imperialism if we get involved, but we should, frankly. The people who are in the streets calling for democracy, who toppled governments, don't want what the Islamists have to offer. They want accountable government and freedom, but the Islamists are better organized, just as the communists were better organized coming out of World War II when the Cold War started. We didn't sit on the sidelines and just lament our friends losing. We actually got involved in places like Italy and Greece, where communist victories would have pulled them out of the West and put them in the Soviet bloc, and we didn't do it out of the goodness of our hearts. It's because American interests were at stake. Today, we, our CIA, our State Department, our taxpayer-funded National Endowment for Democracy is either completely sitting on the sidelines or just getting the whole story wrong. And it's a shame. But this is a contest that'll go on for some time. It's off to a very bad start, and we're behind. But there is still some things we can do. Christian Whiten, thanks very much. Good to see you.